Today we'll be talking about quality of life and testosterone in KS and what do we know. So this begs the question, what is, let me just ask you, what is your quality of life? How do you ask that question? What is your quality of life? Is it good? What's good about your quality of life? What aspects of your life make you feel like you're having a good quality of life or a bad quality of life? It's not just a question of feeling good or feeling better or having few symptoms. In the literature, you read many times that therapies are offered for XYZ condition and they'll say, you need to take, and I love like the Cialis ads or the Viagra ads, this will improve your quality of life. Well, we all know what quality of life they're talking about, but very often people say that they want to improve their quality of life, but what are they actually saying? When you get up in the morning, it's a perfect day? We don't know. So we're gonna investigate a little bit about what quality of life really is and why it's important to measure it. So what is it? Basically, it's a subjective sense of well-being. When you wake up in the morning, sometimes you feel a little off, Sometimes you feel like, I think I'm going to have a good day. I'm not brooding about every, anything. Everything seems to be well inside me today. But it's also the difference between the hopes and expectations of a person and their present experience. Take, for example, a person who's trying to get a better job. You are kind of satisfied. You have an okay quality of life. But certainly, if you got a raise or you got a promotion, then you perceive that your quality of life would be much better. And there's a hope to hang on to. But let's say that you're passed over for that job or you don't have the skills to get there. Where does that leave you? It drops your quality of life very low because then it begins to affect what? Your self-esteem. Because you think, oh my gosh, I wasn't good enough. I'm not qualified enough to participate in my own life, therefore my quality of life is beginning to decrease. Um, it's also related to the degree to which a person enjoys the important possibilities of his or her life. We have to feel like there's something yet beyond us. Has, is anyone here the master of the universe and you have all the money in the world and your children have all graduated Harvard and are gazillionaires? No. And is that really where we want to go? Maybe not. We just always want to have that hope or a possibility that we can do a little bit better, we can get a little bit farther, and that we can improve our overall happiness. Um, and it's also about the perception of the search for meaning in one's own life. Everyone asks from the time you can almost discern, say, about the first grade, why am I here? What am I here for? What can I do? What am I good at? Where do I belong? And so these are all features that really define what quality of life is. There are many psychosocial concepts that go into what we call quality of life. And some of them are self-esteem. You know what good self-esteem is. What is it? You have confidence in yourself. You're good at something. You can do something. What happens when you don't have self-esteem? What does that mean? You feel bad about yourself. And it's not only that you feel lesser in yourself, it's also perhaps that you perceive others perceive that you're lesser than yourself. So it's not only your self-perception, but it's what you think other people are thinking of you. And that all has to do with self-esteem. Self-concept. Who am I? What am I good at? What are the things that will optimize my life? And then body image, and it doesn't matter if you have a congenital this, that, or the other. Everyone, every day, when you're looking in the mirror, and I know you do, when you're shaving or you're combing your hair, if you have a bad hair day, or you especially don't look good, or you don't like your outfit for that day, or you don't feel clean and spiffy, you feel a little grubby, then your body image actually goes down. And so that's really important in the way that you perceive yourself because it affects the way we transact with others. And then there's depression. We all know that depression um, uh, can take your mood and affect low. It reduces your effectiveness in your communication. It reduces your self-esteem. Sometimes it takes you away from the very communities with which you want to transact, and so you become isolated. So in the context of uh, KS and some sex uh, chromosome aneuploidies, sometimes some of the uh, 
uh, behaviors and psychocognitive problems, these disorganized behaviors, the communication and social impairments, make KS boys and, and other sex chromosome aneuploidies especially vulnerable to emotional problems in isolation because they don't transact well with others. They have been told or they feel like they're not good enough or they can't learn or they need special help. And so this all goes into the baseline foundation of how they feel about their lives. But what extent the behavior and the psychological features are consequences of social impact or hormonal deficiencies are yet to be determined. We know um, my KS men in here, if you're low on testosterone, how do you feel about yourself? Shout out. Anyone who's ever been low on testosterone, any KS adult males in the room? Low. You feel low, and how do you feel low? Like depressed. Okay, so you have body image. Uh, you oh. feel depressed, I'm sorry, you feel depressed. You're being uh, too verbal for us. I <laughs> Okay, I'll just make the faces. It's really bad. You don't feel well. You don't feel like getting along with others. You don't seek company. But you, it, and that could be part of the hormone thing. Are there any women old enough, old enough in this room to have been in the cohort of menopausal therapy with estrogen? They, okay, so they monitored that not on the basis of your estrogen or sometimes on bone density, but basically it was a quality of life issue. Can we reduce your symptoms of hot flashes and things like that? So, so hormones are very much related to these psychosocial concepts. Okay, so psychosocial issues often associated with androgen deficiency are communication problems. You know that language-based and cognitive disorders can create problems when children are trying to communicate their needs or trying to transact with others. Um, we also know that children with um, uh, 47XXY can also exhibit very shy behaviors or very aggressive behaviors and sometimes they can alternate between the two. Sometimes they become very frustrated in their shyness and isolation and then can jump over into aggressiveness. Um, impulsivity is another one, just shouting out and not being able to control themselves. Um, and when they get into trouble with others or are disciplined over and over and over again, stop, don't do that, be quiet, be like the other children, it affects their self-esteem. And then they become stigmatized. And stigmatization really is that condition of feeling different. And not only do they feel different, they feel less than. They don't feel as good as. And so they're identified as being a child with a problem. And that is all part of stigmatization. There can also be co-occurring psychiatric conditions we all know about, such as attention, uh, uh, disorder, uh, attention deficit and hyperactivity disorder, um, just overall clinical depression. We've also known of dual developmental disability with psychiatric disorder also associated with these extra Xs, um, and also cognitive social processing problems. Um, Dr. Van uh, Ryan and some of uh, Dr. Van Ryan's not here this year, but some of her colleagues are here and have done lots of research on um, how boys with KS read um, body language, how they're able to read facial expressions, that they're actually not able to recognize the look in a person's eye to tell whether or not they are happy or whether they're sad or whether they're angry. And when you're transacting with another person, that's very important to be able to read the person that you're speaking to. Okay, so what are the aspects of quality of life? Um, there are basically three that we're going to kind of take apart and explore right now, and that is the sense of being. Who am I and what am I right now? How do I feel in my own skin? How do I feel in my own heart? And how do I feel in my own mind? That is my sense of being. And then there's the issue of the sense of belonging. Where do I fit? Do I fit in my family? Do I fit in my school? Do I fit in my community of friends? All about belonging. And then there's the issue of becoming. What do I hope to become? Do I have the capability of being good at something? Am I going to be able to fix cars? Am I, am I going to be able to become a lawyer? Am, I can't believe that, that's my phone. Woo, how embarrassing. <laughs> okay. Um, and so the ability to have hopes and dreams for the future 
um, are very, very important. If you're told, well, you'll never be able to learn that. You don't have the cognitive capabilities of being able to understand this. It will affect their quality of life because they go through life saying, I will never amount to much. And that is not a good position for any child to grow up on or, or even any adult to live through. So let's look again at the concept of being. Being is about physical health. How do you feel? Do you feel healthy today? Isn't that a silly question? Do you feel healthy today? Well, if you have a health problem, anyone here with a chronic health condition, if you have a chronic health condition and it's dogging you that day, whether it be arthritis or a neurological disease or your diabetes is not in good control, that really affects how you feel about yourself that day. Um, your personal hygiene and your nutrition and your exercise all go into how you feel. If you don't feel good, chances are you're probably going to take care of yourself or isolate, but you'll take care of yourself in a way where you kind of isolate and wind up resting too much, not exercising, not eating the right foods. Grooming and physical appearance are very, very important. Have you ever been sick for 10 days? You pull the covers over your head, you don't take a bath for three days, your hair gets all yucky, and how do you feel? I'm a nurse. One of the first things we learn when people are in the hospital is you must bathe them every single day and brush their teeth and comb their hair. Why? Because it helps them feel better. It gives them a better sense of being and it helps them become receptive to recovery and moving on. So psychological being. Um, psychological health and adjustment is very, very important. Resilience kind of falls in there. How many times can you be picked on and teased and yet be able to transact with your friends anyway? Yes, I am good enough. You can go ahead and call me what you want, but I can, make, I can be resilient enough to tolerate and adjust to whatever the social situation is. Um, cognition can be a problem, especially in our KS boys, when there are certain aspects of the language-based communication difficulties that make it hard for them to understand what is actually happening. They might not understand that the very thing they said or the very thing they did um, injured someone or hurt their feelings. And so this is really important because then they feel like their friends don't like them, but it's not because of something that they intended to do, it's that they didn't understand that there was a cognitive barrier there. Um, we do a lot of self-evaluation. Um, when you say something, you think, well, did I say that the right way or did I say it in the way that I meant? We're constantly self-evaluating to the point where you can actually build yourself up and say, yes, I feel good, I did a really good job, I have good self-esteem, or you can say, I'm so afraid to do that or I'm so afraid to say that because I'm nothing, and so the self-esteem then begins to fall. And then there's self-control. Are we able to uh, take and tolerate, this kind of goes back to resilience, are we able to take and tolerate the bumps and the bruises of our everyday life? Uh, now belonging, um, physical belonging has to do with personal connection with our physical environment. Do you fit your home? I mean, some children are not in their homes. Some children are in foster homes, or some children are in, in homes where the people don't necessarily want children. This is a very important concept, especially when you're dealing with a child who has um, uh, possibly cognitive and psychological issues. They must feel like they're at home. They feel comfortable there. Um, when they get older, their workplace is really important. Are they, do they have duties that they're able to fulfill? Are they welcome in their workplace? Does it fit them, their, sk uh, their skills, and are they welcome there? And this is true of their community and their neighborhood. There's nothing worse than a child growing up and feeling like they're the only kid who's different than the other kids on the block. I can't keep up with them. They don't like me. They're isolated in their communities. So this is an important aspect of belonging. Every child needs to feel like they fit into their neighborhood and also their community. The social aspects are um, links with uh, their social environments. Um, do they have best friends? Are they able to do that? Um, often children with um, KS and other disorders isolate unto themselves so that um, they really don't share on the childhood level and that's a really important aspect of growing up and gaining uh, important social skills uh, later in life. How do they transact with family? Are they the special child? 
Are they the child get, that gets all the attention and might possibly be resented by others? It's a very uncomfortable thing to have to talk about within the family. But family, um, the way the child, fit, the way the affected child fits into the family is very, very important. And then whether or not they have friends. Um, sometimes friends come into your life and then friends leave. It's very important for them to feel like they have that sense of community, a sense uh, of peers. And one thing that KSNA does, I think, in a meeting like this, drawing families together, there are boys and girls um, meeting other boys and girls who are like themselves. And so it creates another friendship community for them. Um, coworkers are really important for the adults with KS. Um, sometimes coworkers aren't even aware that uh, that person has KS, but they might think that something might be different, but they don't know. It's very important that uh, people with KS feel like that they are on an equal footing with their peers, with their coworkers, and also with their community. And then becoming is all about purposeful activities. Um, our ability to set goals and express our hopes and wishes is what kind of drives us throughout our lives. We want to become, I want to become a scientist. Um, you may want to become, what, a better real estate agent. You may want to become, you've got to have those dreams out there and it's important that that the children have these opportunities. Um, they must find their competencies. You can't always be bad at something, so we must find the things that they are really, really good at so that they can develop competencies. And, of course, um, domestic activities with small children, we call those household chores. It's really important that they become part of the family in every single function, that they do the dishes, that they make their beds. I'm a mom and I know that doesn't work out most of the time, but um, when they get older, uh, uh, paid work, working part-time in a store or volunteerism. Um, and then there's the promotion of relaxation and stress reduction, which often in our American society, we don't pay much attention to for anybody because we just work and work and work. We go to our professional conventions. We rarely have time for holiday. I think the Europeans have it all over us because they go on holiday maybe for four to six weeks during the summertime and they have that special time of respite where they can restore themselves. It's really important for everyone, especially children who are so bombarded with the fact that they might be different, that they have to go to school, they struggle in school, that they have to have special external therapies over and over again for all these special needs. They never get a rest just to play and be a child, and that's a very important thing. So visiting with family and friends, um, and also holidays and vacations are important there. So how does this relate to KS? This is true for children or adults. Um, androgen deficiency in KS is known to be related to low energy. How many people know that? They suddenly, what happens? They sleep a lot, they might, what? What other low energy? Lack of motivation. We know that it's really important for all children, especially kids with KS, to have physical activity. If you have low energy, do you want to go run around the block? Do you want to hop on your bike and go somewhere? No. So uh, low energy can, can be one of those um, outcomes of having um, a low androgen. Uh, physical functioning and emotional functioning and social functioning as well as mental and eventually reproductive functioning. I'm not talking about reproduction libido but more like the physical attraction part because there's a lot of um, interpersonal negotiation that has to go on when you're attracted to another person. But all of these things, if you have, for a guy with KS, if you have low testosterone, all of these things are affected. And all of these things together add up to a certain aspect of quality of life. So um, have we passed up the, the sheets yet? OK, what we're going to do is a little activity. Um, it's a, this is actually an instrument from James Varney. It's called the Pediatric Quality of Life. But it also would apply to adults. So this is an instrument that can be used from age two through adulthood. Um, it's a scale. We're actually going to take it together. And then I want you to, you're going to take this test, you're going to answer this questionnaire um, as if you were, you're talking about your child. 
If you are the person with KS, go ahead and answer it. If you're a teenager with KS, go ahead and answer the questionnaire for yourself. But if you are the parent of a child with KS, then you answer the questions according to how you think your child would score, how you think your child functions. When you get your papers, there will just be lines, uh, numbers for the questions. Um, you will rate each question, zero if it's never a problem, one if it's almost never a problem, two if it's sometimes a problem, three if it's often a problem, and four if it's almost always a problem. And this will appear on every slide. So we'll go through each one. Are we there yet? Almost? No. Okay. Um, the PEDS-QL actually goes through four separate domains or subscales of quality of life. The first one is physical functioning. So given that scale where zero is never, one is almost never, two is sometimes, three is often, and four is almost always, does your child have trouble or do you have trouble running more than one block? Give a score for that one question. Um, Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, I'm sorry, walking. I jumped the gun. You need one? Yes, if your child has difficulty, and within the past month, let's say within the past month, has your trouble had child walking more than one block? Has your, had, has your child had trouble running? Participating in a sports activity or exercising. And if you're the KS person, answer it for yourself. Lifting something heavy. In the past month, did he have problems taking a shower or a bath by himself? Can you, you tell us which number you're on? You want to uh, yes, one, two, three, four. Uh, taking a shower is number five. Six, has your child had problems doing chores around the house? Of either one, it's as a parent, do you think your child is having trouble for whatever reason doing chores around the house? Um, within the past month, has your child complained of having aches or pains? That's question seven. And then question eight is, within the past month, do you think your child has had a low energy level or do you have a low energy level? Okay, so add all those up. So you've assigned either a zero, a one, a two, a three, or a four. Just write the number down. If, if they don't have trouble walking more than one block, is that never? If they don't well, it's almost always. We don't have never. Or, or ne oh, that is never. I'm sorry. Right, sure. If they don't, if you don't think it's a problem, you've never seen it. Yes. 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 Uh, is it a, an infant? Uh, I think you can apply this to a two-year-old. Is he walking? Okay, then just say walking or getting around. Oh, oh, I see what you're saying. Uh, yeah, just put um, zero. That won't affect his quality of life for sure. Okay, on to the next, emotional functioning. These are questions one through five. Within the past month, do you feel that your child or that you have been feeling afraid or scared in any setting? The second question, how would you rate within the past month your child feeling sad or blue? Within the past month, do you feel that your child has had trouble sleeping? Oh, feeling angry. You know, watching the clock here. Feeling angry. That's number three. Number four is trouble sleeping. Yes. Okay, I'm having trouble. Inversely, do you answer? Are they having trouble with, or if they're feeling angry, almost never do we put one? 
Okay, if they're having trouble sleeping, then you would, if they're not having trouble sleeping, you would put never. Oh, okay. I was, okay. We were doing the double negative thing? Well, you were saying, are they having trouble with? Oh, I, I see what you're saying. Okay. All right, and the last question. Do you think in the past month your child has been worrying about what will happen to him? Okay, moving on to social functioning, there are also five questions here. The first one, um, within the past month, do you think your child has had trouble getting along with other children? Number two, other kids not wanting to be his friend. Number three, getting teased by other children. Number four, not being able to do the things that other children his age can do. And number five, keeping up when playing with other children. So, so this one's different because a high score needs to be functioning. Isn't it? No, it's the same. So if he, if he never has trouble keeping up with children, then that's a better function. <laughs> okay, I'm sure he'd appreciate the feedback. Okay, let's go on to school functioning. Um, do you think your, your child uh, has trouble paying attention in class? The second question is forgetting things. Keeping up with schoolwork. Missed school because of not feeling well are missing school to go to the doctor or to the hospital. So you all have numbers there. You have a stack of numbers. In the real questionnaire, we would transform these to a different scale, and it would reverse so that from 0 to 100, 100 would be greater quality of life. But these are raw scores, so really the lower the number is the better quality of life. I know, I know. Okay, well that's, that's why we reverse it. Anyway, the point of this exercise is not only do you get an overall score because you're looking at physical functioning, emotional functioning, social and school functioning, is that when a child has poor quality of life, sometimes we can go to one of these subscales and say, well, the rest of his life seems to be going pretty well. It's mostly in the social area that we need to target. So diagnostically, that will tell us something. Perhaps we need to work with the school or with, with other therapies in order to boost up this one particular thing. So having answered that as a parent, how do you suppose your child would have answered those same questions? Do you think that you would have come out the same or, or different? About the same? Um, these instruments have been used in um, disorders like Turner syndrome and um, polycystic ovary disease in girls, which is also a hormonal-based disorder. And amazingly, um, the parent and the child uh, forms come out quite different. The parents perceive that the child's quality of life is much poorer than the child perceives. So I think that's really interesting. We worry about our children so much, and sometimes we assume that they're struggling in areas when, when, when they're not, and then sometimes we miss the areas that are really central to what's taking their quality of life down. So um, androgen deficiency affects several body systems, including the brain and the nervous system. Um, it can affect them with fatigue, the inability for them to concentrate or focus, um, psychosocial problems. We heard from Dr. Ross today about uh, cardiometabolic risk, that body composition uh, can be changed, that uh, body composition changes, the body has increased body fat that can uh, lead to future heart disease, 
that they have poor uh, lipid profiles earlier than in life than other non-affected children, and that they might possibly develop um, insulin resistance. We also know that, um, I think it was, oh, it was Dr. Rogel who was talking about building the bone early in life before we start to lose the bone. All of these things are related to um, uh, testosterone. So the magical question that you see on the discussion board groups and you hear conversations and you hear in the doctor's office, I don't know who started this, it was on the, the um, it's a thread on the discussion boards at KSNA, and it was to tea or not to tea, I guess that's the question. So we also heard today from Dr. Rogel about the many forms and dosages of tea that are used today, and um, they're the patch, they're the gel, the patch, and the intramuscular, but what's, from the kid's point of view, what's wrong with each of these? The kids who use the gel, what do they complain about? They don't like the way it feels, and they don't like, they don't like the way it smells. Maybe it's the intense alcohol smell, I don't know. And the patch, what's wrong with that? It's the irritation and the, the fact that they have to change it. And then the intramuscular, obviously, they don't, nobody likes to get shot, so that's always a problem. Um, so so the, the issue here for uh, parents and kids who are old enough to decide for themselves is that there currently are no medical guidelines for how and when to treat KS-related androgen deficiency, especially in children. Is it that we want to give testosterone to make their serum testosterone rise and then just call it a day? You know, you, you started off in the two and three hundreds and now you're at 500, so now you're fixed? Maybe not. Maybe we should be looking at some of these other variables and features that are associated with androgen deficiency, such as the body composition and the bone mineral density. Um, Dr. Uh, Ross also, uh, just before me, quoted um, uh, Dr. Wickstrom's 2006 study with a cohort of uh, 47 uh, Finnish boys and concluded that the boys had sufficient T to allow normal progression of puberty, so there was no evidence or indications for why we should supplement that. Uh, but she was looking at tanner stage, testicular volume, bone age, BMI, and reproductive hormones. So the question is, are there other variables that will show us that giving testosterone therapy will improve their quality of life in other ways? Um, other important yet under-investigated variables to consider are these psychosocial parameters. When you go to the doctor's office, do you, does your child do, get a self-esteem screening? No. Does your child get a quality of life screening? No. So if you have a baseline um, assessment of their psychosocial condition, and then they go on T therapy, if their, if their serum testosterone rises by only maybe 100 milligrams per deciliter, it doesn't really show that much improvement in the serum testosterone, but the quality of life may have improved incredibly. So these are things that we haven't looked at yet. Um, Dr. Fenoy and I are doing a study at Columbia hoping to look at just these things. Um, in the beginning, we're not actually doing a testosterone um, trial because of, as Dr. Ross said, the tremendous expense of it. But we're looking at the correlations between serum testosterone levels and self-esteem, self-concept, quality of life, and depression as a baseline so that we can then take that evidence and add possibly a future trial. We also want to compare affected boys to unaffected boys. Uh, body composition and the establishment of metabolic syndrome is another way to track whether or not testosterone therapy is going to be effective. We know that early in childhood, KS boys um, develop increased visceral fat, and this is directly related to a metabolic syndrome type status. We'll also be looking at insulin resistance. But let's look at that baseline, put them on testosterone therapy, and then see if their body composition changes so that they have less visceral fat. It reduces their cardiovascular risk. And the same thing can be said for bone mineral density. We measure bone mineral density when we're fairly certain that they've lost some bone. Well, let's look at these kids during puberty to see when is it that we first start to see that osteopenia or that first slight loss of bone. 
um, and to see if the testosterone therapy will help them hold on to um, the bone a little bit better. So there are many other ways of assessing whether or not testosterone therapy is going to be effective or not. It's not only in watching serum testosterone rise, but you also have to ask the person, is this improving your quality of life? Do you feel better on this therapy? Um, in the literature, and, and I've done a lot of searching, there is very little um, research on, or bodies of evidence um, on hormone replacement, especially in KS. Um, certainly a little bit in adults, but most of the bodies of evidence on hormonal therapy are in menopausal women, and quality of life was the very thing that they asked us. Does this improve? Are you able to sleep better? Does this reduce your hot flashes? These are all related to women. There's more evidence now for andropausal men. We call that menopause, I guess. Um, but for men who, uh, in their sixth to seventh decades of life, normally their testosterone drops and they experience the same hypogonadal uh, symptoms as some of the KS boys do. So um, they're now uh, doing trials, or they have been doing trials for a while, of testosterone replacement therapy in men to see if it improves what? Their quality of life and whether it preserves their bone mineral density. Um, Turner syndrome, polycystic ovary disease, and congenital adrenal hyperplasia are also other disorders that use these types of variables to track whether or not their hormonal therapy is working. So it just seems like we should be looking at these variables as well, not just the serum testosterone. Okay, um, there's been an underassessment of quality of life in hormone replacement studies. Um, in the ones that I've read, especially related to KS, the, they'll say, well, testosterone therapy over five years will improve quality of life. And so you page through the paper and you say, well, that's great. Like, what part of quality of life? Well, I guess they just asked them, did you feel better? There's a lot more to quality of life than feeling better. So this tells me in our science and the way that we go forward, these are important um, areas that we need to investigate, not only overall quality of life and sense of well-being, but what parts of quality of life does it affect? Does it affect your body? Does it affect your psychological uh, outlook? Does it affect the way you transact with other people, your vitality? These are all things that I think we need to be looking at in KS. Um, uh, and, well, what I meant to say was the, in, the objective reports also fail to show any data. They're not measuring quality of life. They're just saying, well, do you feel better after six weeks of this or do you not? So um, we need to generate more data that, that shows objectively where the quality of life, how much it's improved and where in those domains has the improvement happened. So um, once again, this is like the third time you've heard this today, but um, there's so many unanswered testosterone therapy questions. Um, what dose and route is optimum? Uh, Dr. Uh, Rogel prefers in younger children to use the uh, intramuscular injection, um, and there are many, many good reasons for that, but how do we create therapies where people will continue to use them? We've already heard some of the adolescent boys, you give them a pump, they'll use it for how long? and then they don't use it anymore because it's a hassle, it's messy, it smells. So we have to start thinking of, um, of perhaps alternate ways. And the, we talked about the pellet early this morning as a, as a possible um, alternative. At what age or developmental stage should therapy be initiated? Well, you all know with any boy going through puberty, it doesn't happen at age 12.5. Yeah, puberty may begin at age nine, or puberty may begin at age 14. So it's not so much age, and it's not really even tanner staging of the genitals. There are many other uh, factors that go into finding, and, and growth, of course, of uh, assessing when puberty begins. And so we need to investigate that more clearly and find out should we be initiating therapy peripubertally um, and onward. So we just need to do more research. And by what measure will therapeutic benefit be monitored? So you put testosterone in, and then you measure the testosterone out. Well, what other measurements are we going to take to show or to collect in order to show that testosterone therapy is being effective for that person?
Um, and then there's the question of how will future health be monitored in regard to hormone replacement therapy. Nobody, no health care provider wants to hurt your child. We don't have any indication right now that testosterone therapy is going to hurt your child. And yet we don't have longitudinal cohort studies that show people or males that have been on hormone therapy for 45 years don't have an increased risk for some other disease. So that, that information is yet to be fine, uh, figured out. Um, and so we, in, under that, we need to figure out what future health risks must be surveilled. What are the things that we really need to watch do we need to especially watch bone? Do we need to especially watch cardiovascular disease or brain function? These are still all unanswered questions. So coordinated effort um, is really needed. The literature right now does not have enough supportive evidence to develop testosterone treatment guidelines. Someone asked the great question about the, um, the the pediatrician and an endocrinologist, and just a, your garden variety endocrinologist, pediatric endocrinologist, can't agree. It's, it's an individual decision for them to place your child on therapy, and how they're going to do it is just kind of out there. There are no published guidelines, and guidelines must be based on clinical evidence, and we don't have enough clinical evidence to build those guidelines yet. Um, we need to really, really study um, KS uh, using uh, or looking at their physical traits, their psychosocial, uh, cardiometabolic, bone parameters. Um, and these need to be collected all across the lifespan, from the time that they're infants all the way until they're full-grown men. Um, more research funding and KS subject participation needs to lay the groundwork for the development of future treatment. We need all the KS kids that we can in all these areas of research so that we can begin to build this body of evidence so that we eventually will be able to establish guidelines that will take very good care of not only your children, but the generations of children behind it. So the pathways to progress on this is to systematically build testosterone therapy evidence on all domains of health, the physical, the psychosocial, the psychocognitive, the psychoeducational, all those things are really important. And being willing to participate in, in research so that um, evidence will accumulate. And I think the biggest thing of all is for you all as parents, as families, as healthcare providers, um, to continue your valuable dialogues and queries because the more questions that we can ask and the more answers we try to find for your questions, the more we will advance this science along the way. Thank you. <clears throat>
in individuals who already have an underlying risk for decreased bone density to be sure that they get evaluated for their vitamin D status and that they are taking optimal um, amounts of vitamin D uh, because it can only make things more of a problem, not less. Yes. <laughs> the, the conference proceedings will be posted online uh, and also, I think, available in notebook form and also CD. The uh, question about timing of puberty does, the answer is that timing of puberty does seem to be a bit um, dependent on family patterns. So families that have early puberty tend to have children who have early puberty, and uh, the opposite is true in terms of delayed puberty. So this is one of the reasons why an arbitrary age uh, for starting testosterone therapy may not be appropriate. Um, the other um, uh, issue is that people need to realize that the normal age of puberty in a male is from age 9 to 14. I mean, the normal age to begin. So it is normal to begin at 9 or it's normal to begin at 14. These two children don't look anything alike. The child who begins at 14 versus the child who begins at 9, they look totally different because one's in puberty and one's not. But both are perfectly normal, right? And for girls, it's 8 to 13 and a half. So since we have such a wide range for the normal onset of puberty, it's very hard to pick one age as the age that all boys with KS should automatically be put on testosterone. Mm -hmm. So can the experts in KS accurately determine when a child started puberty? There are biochemical markers of the onset of puberty as well as physical markers for the onset of puberty. So you can look at hormones um, and tell whether a person has um, moved from the prepubertal state to the early pubertal state. So that's easily diagnosable. So frequently, like in my practice, I tend to monitor children every six months after the age of nine uh, for boys to see when puberty starts because I'm not going to have any uh, magical way of knowing for any one child. What I struggle with that is you know, I've got to find uh, to help bring on the onset of puberty. I mean, most of the factors seem to be uh, familial, genetic, uh, but there is a tendency for excess weight to be associated with earlier onset of puberty. Um, there's a whole new area of endocrine research on endocrine disruptors. Uh, so we're talking about plastics in the environment that leach into the soil and water that tend to have uh, endocrine mimetic, they act like hormones on the body. Uh, so all of those things are potential contributors to a particular child uh, deviating in terms of when they would go into puberty uh, different from when they otherwise might be expected to. Uh, there are compounds that are sold over the counter like um, in girls, um, lavender, uh, lavender has estrogenic activity. So uh, we've seen some girls where the parents were bathing the child in uh, lavender uh, uh, bubble, bath. bubble bath. Bubble bath. And they start pubertal development early. Um, so, I mean, there are a number of things that have uh, hormonal activity that are not hormones that are in the environment, and one has to be careful about them. 
I'm, I'm thinking of things even like, um, they spoke of, and I, I read this a while back, something about with puberty ages coming down in this country, it was being attributed uh, even to exposure of what uh, they're viewing on TV and things of that nature, uh, with the exposed, um, like, sexual, um, that hasn't been as clearly shown to be responsible for a uh, change in the timing of puberty, but uh, more an issue about the behaviors uh, that children engage in and how they respond uh, to uh, information and how other people interact with them. Um, but timing seems to be much more related, currently at least in our thinking, to issues in the environment, uh, the, the obesity epidemic that is generally across um, the country and what that's doing to hormonal regulation. And then uh, more basic, the familial genetic uh, tendencies. In the back. Um, can, uh, as far as the onset of puberty, can you look to basically to the father for, when you say, you know, genetics, can you look to the father to find out roughly when he went through puberty and it might be repeated? Because I think for girls you can look towards the mother's family. Actually we look at both for both girls and boys. So there is no way to know uh, which tendency the child will inherit, the mother's or the father's family tendency. So uh, we look for both in assessing pubertal onset with or without KS. So I'm just talking about any child that comes in with a question about timing of puberty, the interest is in having information on both parents. Yes? I don't know if this is uh, proper form, but the cost the come down, I preface this by saying I started off with the injections, went to the patch, the cost and my insurance wouldn't cover it, so I just dropped it. That's still a major problem. The newer forms are more expensive than the older forms, so that the most uh, inexpensive form is the injectable form, and the more expensive are the gels and the patches. And um, at the moment, there isn't any um, absolute uh, resolution of that because of the whole issue of uh, drug abuse um, or athletes abusing drugs that increase muscle mass and therefore give them more sp strength. Uh, testosterone is a controlled substance just like heroin and morphine uh, and that creates barriers to getting continuous prescriptions for medication and it also means that uh, pharmaceutical companies, and, not pharmaceutical, insurance companies frequently take the attitude that uh, they don't want to deal with it and therefore they'll have reasons why they won't cover it um, even if you have a medical need or they make you jump through hoops to prove that you have a medical need to continue having it reimbursed uh, by insurance and that's an issue that isn't resolved and it's variable by state because the states are responsible for the, uh, the individual um, prescription um, rules that a physician has to follow. I have no idea. Uh, I don't. Um, in talking about um, onset of puberty, since we often find that our boys are sometimes developmentally delayed, do you find that puberty <coughs> falls under? Develop, um, development in terms of mental development, learning development, is totally different from physical development. Uh, the two do not necessarily coincide at all. So there is no expectation based on um, learning uh, development uh, in terms of what's going to happen in terms of pubertal development. And puberty doesn't necessarily go along even with physical skills. So for instance, the child who has um, a, a brain lesion 
at birth. So they may have cerebral palsy, they may have um, a cyst in the brain from a bleed in the newborn period. Those children make up through early puberty rather than normal or average. So um, puberty is its own issue, separate from uh, physical capabilities and separate from learning capabilities or development. Yes. For a, for a boy with XXY who is um, determined to not be testosterone in puberty, that his numbers just look okay, would there be any recommendations specific to nutrition or, or diet um, or, you know, nutritional and vitamin support that would be recommended to put them in the best shape for entering adulthood? We don't have any specific uh, research on XYY in terms of nutritional. It, oh, in terms of XXY? I um, mean, in terms of the general nutritional for all the groups uh, XY, XXY, XYY, um, X, triple X, the nutritional information is pretty much the nutritional information for the general populace. There is the whole issue about the testosterone estrogen ratio that has been a big issue in the XXY community. But that's still very much an unresolved issue. And there are products in the environment that foster estrogen activity. So parents have uh, tried to limit exposure to estrogens. We don't know really whether that's a good uh, approach or not, particularly since the more recent data on the brain uh, suggests that masculine behavior may be dependent on estrogen at critical periods of life. So that the brain uh, seems to determine its masculine behavior based on estrogen levels during development. So we're talking about like in utero, uh, we're talking about animal experiments that have shown this to be true. Um, so you know, manipulating the testosterone-estrogen ratio is something we don't have any data on, and it's just problematic for parents to do that. I mean, they're free to do it, but there's nothing we can say definitively in terms of how it will benefit your child or hurt your child, All right? So it's really still nutrition, the nutrition we have for all children. Can you uh, talk a little bit more about the, the environmental products or stimuli that uh, promote estrogen uh, stimulation? I can talk. I Go. Oh. Go. <laughs> um, right now, bisphenol A, bisphenol A uh, plastics have been associated with um, estrogenic effects in the environment. Uh, bisphenol A. Um, right, uh, many states now have enacted new laws preventing baby bottle companies from manufacturing anything made with these plastics. You'll see it BPA, and I forget what the code is on the bottom, but if you Google BPA, you'll get a lot of uh, hits on that. Uh, within the past two years, there's been research on the East Coast um, of uh, fish and other fauna in uh, streams and waterways showing uh, bisexuality in terms of uh, having ovarian and testicular um, components in their bodies, such as frogs and fish. And they found um, in a couple of these communities that these ponds had very high levels of uh, equine estrogen. Um, and you think, well, that's horse pee. So why would there be horse urine, so much horse urine in one part of the country? And some of the theories are that women who were on uh, estrogen therapy, which Premarin is made from horse urine, that in the elimination, just the normal elimination of women who've been on hormonal therapies, actually gets into the environment, goes downstream, we're bathed in it, we drink it. Um, so that may be one of the, those are some of the environmental exposures. But this area, this area is really still very much under investigation. The, uh, the plastics is the one that has gotten the most uh, documentation for. Um, and there are all sorts of um, FDA 
actions being taken to limit exposure um, of children to um, things that are leached out of plastic into the water or the milk because babies are the most vulnerable group. And then uh, soy also, soy products, estrogen, right? Uh, soy products do have uh, uh, estrogens. They are phytoestrogens, uh, so plant-based estrogenic activity. However, they have not clearly been shown to have any adverse effect um, and to initiate early puberty. None of that has been demonstrated from that exposure. But part of it is still uh, in question. We're still using soy formulas. Uh, there has been no move to discontinue that in any way um, because they also have a lot of uh, positive things and nothing adverse has been associated with them. Certainly children who receive soy formulas are not being shown to go into an early puberty. I think we're at time anyway. Yes. Okay. So if that's the last question, thank you very much. Thank you.